Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It was quite awesome to see all the adventures up here today. Thank you, kids, adults. That was really good. Um, before we begin to share God's Word, I would like us to pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who is our Creator. He is our Redeemer. We thank you for the abundance of all things, and we ask for forgiveness, and we ask that you will fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit to overflowing this morning, and that you will grant us knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As Christians, what are we all waiting for? The return of Jesus. And today we're going to look at a passage in which Jesus is talking to the disciples about this very event. We have a lot of ground to cover this morning. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew 25 and verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31. We have a lot to go over. Let's read together. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom for you from the foundation of the world. So at this point, Jesus has returned, and he sets up a courtroom. So we'll continue reading. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Excuse me. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. So in this courtroom scene, Jesus judges and the righteous are set on his right hand and ready to receive the kingdom. This is a scene of judgment. This is a scene of judgment, isn't it? Give me a moment. I'm okay now. This is a scene of judgment, but I'm okay. That was close. Let's read on. Got a lot to cover. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, 
To the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In this courtroom scene, the righteous and wicked have been separated, and they have been judged according to a standard, and now they receive their sentence. What I'd like for us to do today is explore this courtroom scene to see how the kingdom is going to be fulfilled. So in doing that, there first of all we can note a few important words throughout this passage. And one that's always picked on is sheep. You know, throughout the Bible, God's people are always referred to sheep. And in the New Testament, in John 10, 27, Jesus says, the sheep hear my voice, right? And it's interesting to note that sheep and goats in a shepherd's flock were always grazed as mixed flocks. So the sheep and the goats were always grazed together. And it's important to note that they were very hard to distinguish from each other. So when the shepherd had to separate them for whatever purpose he needed to do, he would do it based upon behavior because they were very close in appearance. And obviously, sheep, their behavior has a tendency to follow, whereas goats have a tendency to stray. It's quite interesting. This courtroom scene is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, 17 through 22, where God says, Behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between ram and male goats. Well, the next word we'd like to take a look at is Lord. Throughout the Bible, people who acknowledge someone as Lord acknowledge them as having authority in their life. Okay, this is clear throughout the Bible. And as a matter of fact, the SDA Bible Commentary says that only professed followers of Jesus ever used this word. And they used it to indicate that they were a disciple. And in this passage, if we look back through, remember both the righteous and the accursed ones called the Son of Man or the King Lord. This judgment is similar to the one found in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, where the Lord says, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. This courtroom scene is for professed followers. Now I'm getting a little nervous, because I just gave some of you something to drink. And I gave some of you something to eat, didn't I? Hmm. Well, before I get too concerned, let's take a look at some more words. Okay, the next word I'd like to look at is the word brother, or in some versions it's brethren. And this has caused some confusion amongst Christians at large. The Greek word here for brother is adelphon, and it has a prefix or a base, adelphē. And this word means one who is connected by the tie of the Christian religion or a believing one. So Jesus is talking about believing brothers. In fact, in the 41 times that this word is used in the New Testament, all of those times are in reference to a brother or a family member. Okay, keep these on your mental shelf here because we're marching through a progression. Also, we should note that at this time that Jesus is talking to his disciples and he didn't have the usual large crowd around him. Okay, if we look back in Matthew 24, 3, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives and it said, the Bible says that the disciples came to him privately. So Jesus starts to discuss the end time events and his return. This was a private discussion. And most expositors agree that this discussion, when he pointed to the least of these, he was pointing to his disciples. So keep these things in note. Because against popular opinion, 
The least of these, my brethren, does not mean all men. It doesn't mean the poorest or the sickest or the disenfranchised or the Gentiles. Jesus was telling his disciples that the righteous do these things to their brothers. And who did Jesus say were his brothers? Matthew 12:50 gives us that answer. Jesus says, "For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my brother and sister." This courtroom drama is about believers taking care of believers and not the world at large. Is everyone with me here? Good? Okay. So Jesus has returned and he sets up a courtroom. The righteous and the wicked have been separated. They've been judged according to a standard and now they receive their sentence. Professed believers are judged to a law that holds them accountable as to whether they cared for their brothers. Wow, this list that Jesus gave them is a law that's holding them accountable. So maybe we should take a closer look at this list. Would you agree? Well, as we study the Bible, we can take a look at passages from several different points of view. One of them, we can, we can take this passage literally, which means we can take these words and describe them in a physical or temporal way. Meaning, can we take these and do something that we can touch and feel? Well, in fact, most Christians today interpret this list literally. That is why we have an extensive number of ministries in all countries in the name of Jesus. Okay, we have food pantries, we have uh, water resourcing, we have animal production, we have community services, we have prison ministries, and we have health ministries. This is an, a literal interpretation of this list. Then we could look at it spiritually which means we take these words and we make a spiritual application to our lives for an eternal purpose. An example of spiritualizing would be found in Matthew 13:45 with the parable of the pearl of great price where the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who purchases a pearl. We're not out, all out going buying pearls, are we? I didn't think so. That is a spiritual interpretation. Then we could look at it legally, because in a courtroom, judging someone demands a standard by which they are measured against. In other words, a law. And I don't believe that Jesus ever judged his people on laws that they never knew. So we should be able to go back into the scrolls, into the Old Testament, and we should be able to look at God's commandments, his statutes, and ordinances. And I bet you we find this list of deeds that Jesus is telling his disciples today. But we don't have time to exhaust all three methods. But what we're trying to do is find out what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 25. And which one of these approaches makes sense? So how do we determine which approach should, that we should use? Well, let's take a look at this courtroom drama and see that if there is a context to which it is set within. Remember, we look back at Matthew 24, 3. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately. He starts this discussion on his return. And then in Matthew 25, Jesus starts talking about some parables. Right, everybody there? The first parable is about the ten virgins. And we should note a couple of things about the ten virgins. One, there were ten of them, and the virgins typically are denoted as people who are pure and unspotted. In other words, believers. And the ten virgins also, did they not wait for the same master? They did, didn't they? 
And when, they, when he came, did they not all call that same Master Lord? So the virgins are all believers. We always interpret this message here, this parable, in a spiritual sense. Well, the next parable is the one that the pastor spoke of a couple of weeks ago, the talents. And there's a man that goes on a long journey and he leaves his servants, or in some versions it says slaves, to work for him. Well, one of the most important things I pulled out of there is that the Bible says that these servants or slaves were the master's own servants. And our interpretation of this passage is spiritual. Well, then we come to the judgment scene. Jesus is talking privately about the righteous and what they are doing for their brothers. So Jesus is walking his disciples through a progression. You first will be ready at all times. Then you will be working right until the time that I return, where you will be judged according to a standard. We all there? Okay, this is the progression through Matthew 25. So since the preceding parables to our passage today are interpreted spiritually, maybe we should apply a spiritual interpretation to this list of deeds. I am sick, food, drink. Wow, with that said, that brings up a couple of uh, potential challenges. And before we go on, I'd like to address those. If this scene is about professed followers, caring for professed followers, in other words, brother caring for brother and not the world at large, some might ask, why would we do anything for the lost? If I'm judged in this way, caring for my brother, why would I care about a lost and dying world? Because there are plenty of other passages in the Bible where foreigners, where aliens, where those from another fold or flock, meaning the Gentiles, are brought in to be God's people. A spiritual interpretation of this passage in no way jeopardizes the Great Commission. Well, we might ask, what about a literal interpretation? This passage seems to demand a spiritual interpretation. And if these deeds were not literal, why would we have so many ministries reaching out to a lost world? Or poor brothers. Why? Because the Bible has many other passages that tell us to do these things. We want to be clear about what this passage is saying. If we look in 1 John 3.17, John says, Whoever has the world's goods, that means real physical stuff, and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Interpreting this passage spiritually does not jeopardize doing something tangible. Everybody here with me? Okay. So what about the spiritual meaning of this list? That's what we're trying to boil down to. I think that we can look at the history of the children of Israel to help us answer that. The history of the Israelites was always one of rebellion and rebuke, right? They rejected God, they rejected His law, and they found themselves continually being judged. And God's accusations centered around two main things. One, they rejected God by practicing idolatry. And the second ag uh, accusation was, two, they rejected their brothers and oppressed their people by practicing lawlessness. Let's take a look at a few Old Testament passages where the, um, the accusations of the Lord are being levied against the people of Israel. Everybody turn to Hosea 4, 1 through 2, please. 
In Hosea 4, 1 through 2, the Lord says, There is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence against their own people. In Amos 4.1, the Lord addresses the principal men of the Israelites in the metropolis of the ten tribes. And he says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy of their own people. In Malachi, the Lord addresses Israel, Malachi 2.10. Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of the fathers? Wow, these are some heavy accusations. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, God constantly rebuked the Israelites for oppressing their poor, their needy, their widows, and their orphans. You know, I think that the Israelites actually cared for the heathen nations around them better than they did their own people. Well, these accusations don't stop in the Old Testament. They come forward to the New Testament, where Jesus addresses the leaders and Paul addresses the new Gentile converts. In Luke 11:46, Jesus said, Woe to you lawyers as well! For you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. They would rather see their own people condemned and lost. And for the new Gentile converts, Paul warns them in Galatians 5.15. But if you bite and devour one another, Take care that you are not consumed by one another. Paul saw this as a problem because it didn't matter whether you were Jew or Gentile. Oppressing and killing the brothers went throughout all of history. God accused his own people for rejecting him and for rejecting their own flesh and blood. They constantly broke covenant with God and with their brothers. Remember Cain and Abel? How about Jacob and Esau? How about Joseph and his brothers? And Lucifer and Jesus? Looking back at the Israelites can help us see that this list that Jesus was giving should have been known by the disciples. Well, how does it come up in the New Testament, this list again? Well, in an interesting way. In 1 John 4.20, John says, If you can't love your brother whom you can see, how can you love God who you can't see? And I will add, if you can't love your brother and you can't love God, then how can you love a dying world? Impossible. In John, 1 John 5, 2, John now tells us what it means to love our brothers. By this we know that we love the children of God if we obey the commandments. Our duty is clear. In fact, most of the New Testament is about brothers building up brothers. About builders, uh, believers building up their brothers through encouragements, through teaching, through admonishment, rebuke, and correction, and loving them. All these things we find in the New Testament. Now what about this list? We've got to come back to this list sometime. The context of Matthew 25 suggests a spiritual interpretation. So what could be some of the spiritual meanings of these things in the list? What about food and drink? Any ideas? In, first, in John 6, 48 through 55, 
John tells us what real food and real drink are. Food, real food is my flesh, the real drink is my blood. Jesus said he was the bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. Jesus said he was living water. It is his death and his resurrection of which he's talking about. That is our food and our drink. What about clothing? Well, Isaiah talks about it in 64.5. He talks about our garments of righteousness. We are admonished to practice righteousness and not lawlessness. We want to wear those garments. And in Isaiah 61.3, we have garments of praise. We're always to be giving thanks to the Lord. And then the wedding clothes of Matthew 22.12. There are a lot of spiritual garments that we must be wearing. And what about the sick? Well, in Matthew 9.12, Jesus said, It is not the healthy, but the sick, that need a physician. Was he talking about the flu? King David mentioned this. King David said he was sick and afflicted, and he wasn't sick when he said that. But what was he referring to? King David was sick and afflicted with sin, and he wanted to be cleansed, and he wanted to be healed. Jesus knew that there were many Old Testament passages that would guide the disciples' spiritual understanding. He caused them to think. And maybe he wanted them to think about Isaiah 61.1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. It wasn't people behind bars, was it? It was prisoners to the law of sin and death. Okay, so we have many meanings. Maybe he wanted the disciples to think about Ezekiel 34.4, where he levies another accusation against the Israelites. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and severity you have dominated them. Wow. That's because they did these things to their own people. Maybe Jesus wanted the disciples to think, think about Zechariah 7, 8 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. And do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears from hearing. They made their hearts like flint so they could not hear the law. Remember the covenant of our fathers? This is the law that is being spoken of. So Jesus reminded them of the law. It's a list about spiritual health and obedience. And it was nothing new to the disciples. They had to be reminded. Jesus is also making it clear who's going to be the judge. Because back in Ezekiel 18, God says that he will judge each man according to his conduct. We're talking about behavior, separating the sheep and the goats based upon behavior or their conduct. Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that everyone will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the reward of their deeds in the flesh. In Matthew 25, Jesus is telling his disciples to be ready and working by building up their brothers. In fact, we must all be reminded of building up our brothers, reminding them of righteousness, justice, and mercy. We must remind them of the life de and death and resurrection of Jesus. We must remind them to practice righteousness, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
we must remind them of sanctification through simple obedience to the law. And this is because all of us are prone to stumble. Do we as a church truly care for our brothers? Sure, we go help the homebound. We take meals to the sick. Sure, we create events to fellowship and bond. But are we committing the same sin that Jesus addressed to the leaders of Israel in Matthew 23, 15? Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you travel around on sea and land to make one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Wow, they practiced the Great Commission. But they weren't obedient. We must re-examine our deeds and our obedience. Does this judgment seen in Matthew 25 make each one of us our brother's keeper? Does this judgment seen in Matthew 25 demand that each one of us be entrusted to each other? About a month ago, I received a call from a Christian brother of mine who told me about an incident in another Christian family. And I could not believe my ears. I really wanted to talk to these people. And I was trying to set things in motion. And then when I was at the, at the store with my daughter Olivia, we ran into one of the family members at the store. And for 30 minutes, and through a lot of tears, they relived this incident that ended up in a physical assault and a police report. You know, I knew the offending family member. And I got to tell you, I was a little mad. Okay? So, after several attempts of trying to contact this family member, we finally got together over lunch. And we chit chatted, we ate, and then I turned to the discussion to ask them how they were doing. They said, Well, I'm struggling. I said, okay, and we talked a little bit about their struggles, and then I turned to the discussion to the assault. And I said, I've heard these things, and the family member admitted to it. Wow. What I then proceeded to do was tell them that they were wrong. You're wrong. You are disobeying the fifth commandment. You are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong. And you need to go seek forgiveness and reconciliation. And if you need to, you better make restitution. I said, whoa. They agreed. Then I proceeded to tell them that I would do anything I could to help them do this. If I had to hold them up, I would do it. If I had to hold their hand, I would do it. If I had to write the words on a paper for them to seek forgiveness, I would do that. I made my brother accountable to me for his behavior, and I told him that he, I would be accountable to him for making it happen. A week later, this family member called me on the phone and said that they were doing what we agreed upon. You see, my brother is entrusted to me. A few years ago, maybe about five years ago, 
I had a Christian brother come up to me and he said, Robert, why are you teaching Sabbath school? I said, whoa, well, why do you ask? He says, because you're mad at God and I don't think you should be teaching Sabbath school. I said, well, let me get the knife out of my back. Hold on, Christian, judge me. What about you? What about you? But I didn't say those things, but they were going through my mind, right? And right when they were going through my mind, also the Holy Spirit spoke and said, deny yourself. Lift your brother up. And I said, okay, I'll take those things under advisement. So I walked away stunned and confused. Several months later, I resigned from teaching Sabbath school. Because my brother was right. I was mad. And anybody who was in my frame of reference could never teach God's people objectively. My brother judged my sin and he approached me on it. And today, because of what he did, and what the Lord has been doing in my life, I am healing from that. I am entrusted to my brother. We are all entrusted to each other. To feed, to give drink, and to heal. And to visit. But it's spiritual food and drink. It's obedience. And it's the ability to stand in the judgment of which Jesus is telling his disciples in Matthew 25. We must be able to stand. We should consider this in every ministry that we have. We must have a sense of urgency. Just like Peter did with Cornelius and his family in Acts 10. Peter comes to Cornelius and he doesn't have a lot of fluff beforehand. He comes and says to him and his family, you need to repent, you need to believe, you need to be baptized, and you need to be baptized now. So in like manner, when we get together, it should not be limited to fellowship and bonding. It should not be limited to hobby ministries where we can connect. We must make the most of every time with our brothers to teach, to build, to admonish, to rebuke, correct, to care for, and to love. What kind of people will fulfill the kingdom of heaven and live on the new earth as brothers and neighbors? People who continually give each other spiritual food spiritual drink, spiritual clothes. Those will be part of the Lord's flock. Amen. At this time we will have the adventurers, the adventurers come up and have our closing hymn and also the deacons will take up the offering at this point in time.